I'm really, very, really, very happy to, to uh, open this event because it is the first public event that we organized since uh, uh, March uh, 2020. And, uh, and I'm very happy for that. And this event has a double status. It is uh, obviously the launch of the academic year of the EDAR. At the same time, it is the launch of a lecture series entitled Scholars in Transition. And uh, what's the idea uh, in, uh, this, uh, in this title? The idea really came uh, to me discussing with uh, the two guests of tonight, Joachim de Clerc and uh, Filippo de Pieri. So welcome uh, you both. Uh, the idea went because uh, when I invited them, uh, my intention was uh, to make them debate uh, starting from their research activity on the relation between city and production, on the relation between the form of the city, the economy, uh, rely, a relation between society, technology, because it is part of their research activity. But after talking with both of them, I was really impressed by the fact that they were both shifting a bit aside from the topic that I was uh, uh, proposing related to, to the her, their own curricula. Um, they were both, uh, or they are in fact, both experiencing a shift in what is relevant for them according with the public debate, with their research questions, uh, according to what they are observing uh, happening in between their own research question and the phenomena that are out there, that are outside. And uh, so I, in fact, it is discussing with them that I decided to launch this series uh, and uh, put this title, Scholars in Transition, where scholars are meant to present the subject of their present research and uh, reveal in that way uh, their shifting condition. Uh, the fact that they are uh, experiencing definition of new paradigm, of new approaches, uh, that they are defining a new research agenda, uh, which is uh, obviously uh, new, related to their own personal trajectory and related to the state of the discipline uh, they are representatives of. Tonight, uh, Joachim de Clerc, will uh, explain us the way he currently is asking the question, what planning is about. And uh, he'll do that in terms of research by design. And uh, uh, you'll see the, the theme of the production of urban space, and in particular, the theme of the um, maintenance of the city will be particularly uh, relevant in, in his lecture. Filippo De Pieri will speak on the basis of his studies on the cities that are today UNESCO sites. And uh, with a strong relation uh, to what these sites um, has been in terms of uh, uh, centers of uh, um, economic uh, specific activity. Uh, I just mentioned uh, uh, Filippo has worked on La Chaux de Fonds, uh, is a representative of uh, uh, economic uh, manufacture uh, economics, and also he has worked on uh, Nice, representative of the city or which economy uh, relies on uh, tourism. And it is very interesting the fact that his researches are in a bit, in a sort of redefining uh, not only uh, what uh, urbanism in the 19th century uh, has been, but also they are redefining uh, the impacts that this kind of urbanism and this uh, way of looking at the city as a heritage can have on our present uh, planning uh, condition and planning agenda. And uh, so I'm very happy we are going to uh, listen uh, first uh, Joachim uh, in, during uh, half an hour, then it will be the turn of uh, Filippo during half an hour, 
then we'll have a discussion. And I'm also very happy because uh, we can have, <laughs> we have here Matthew Skiosberg, uh, our guest uh, discussant. He was a PhD uh, student in EDAR. <laughs> now he's coordinating the, the uh, doctoral program in landscape and uh, urban studies at, uh, at ETHZ, Missouri. So it's very nice also that we, our doctoral programs can meet in such an occasion. And, um, and so in the discussion, I'll be very supported by Lucas uh, you know, from Archizoom for the, all technical aspects uh, and also from, by, by SILA, uh, who is really supporting all the organizations. SILA Karata is uh, with Mark uh, Edouard, uh, the two uh, representatives of, uh, of PhD students. Very, very helpful for the initiative. So, Joachim, Joachim, uh, before uh, giving your, you the floor, uh, just a short introduction. Uh, Joachim de Klerk is engineer architect and he has founded the uh, um, Architecture Workroom Brussels, a European think and do tank for innovation in the field of architecture and urban and regional development. Um, he uh, is Presently, uh, guest uh, professor at uh, EBFL, so really, uh, yes, began uh, in September. We are very happy for that. And uh, um, we can mention uh, about uh, his past activity, the curation of uh, the um, uh, International uh, Architectural Biennale in Rotterdam uh, in uh, 2012, with the title Making City. And he, at the same year, he was also uh, part of the uh, curator team of the Belgian Pavilion uh, at the Biennale in Venice with the title uh, The Ambition of the Territory. I let you, Joachim, to, uh, to have the floor. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you to all. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, can you see my screen at the moment? Yes. That's good news. Um, thanks. 2012 was indeed a very tiring year. Um, we indeed, we had in fact three biennials, park design in Brussels on the future of open space in a very dense uh, city, the Belgian Pavilion in Venice and the Rotterdam Architecture Biennale. But it was also a very productive year, and I think um, some of what I will present uh, even dates back to that, to those three uh, moments in time um, and those three uh, types of um, cultural events, which we always see as, a, yeah, as the free space to explore new ideas, um, to allow designers to uh, work in a non-commercial uh, environment uh, on the pressing questions we face, um, and that is what I will um, uh, work um, through in this uh, lecture. I uh, used a title of, it's also the title of the project, um, which is even better in Dutch. It's the, the Grote Verbouwing uh, is better. It's the great renovation or transformation, but in the sense of renovation um, of our uh, urban environment, 2020, 2030. Um, I wrote uh, some of the uh, major questions because the, the question I was asked by um, for this lecture is not to uh, show off um, and tell you how good uh, we are, uh, because of course we are very good. Um, um, I am joking uh, for the moment, but especially to show you where we have doubts, where we are self-critical, um, and where we are trying to find new ways to um, to make um, next steps. Um, I think the three little sentences that I wrote down here under the title. Uh, the Great Transformation Space is a binding mobilizing platform for diverse interests, dynamics, and actors. This is a way the way we look at space. I was um, debating in a transition conference where space was seen as a transition system, that just like the energy system. I um, forcefully acted against that in that conference because I think space is actually something that is underlying and connecting um, and should not be seen as a system with its own uh, right. Two, spatial transformation is a lever for the landing and welcoming of ambitious goals, climate, biodiversity, circularity, solidarity in our lives and living environments. We have a, a, a mission um, uh, without, uh, I will come back to that, but without uh, transformation, transitions that we plea for cannot uh, happen. 
And the, the, the major question, uh, where well, there should be a question mark at the end of the sentence I see now, how can the design practice or practices um, contribute to the structuring, accompanying and enabling of spatial transformation as a societal movement? Because I think that is actually what we are facing. Hence also reusing the title, The Great Transformation uh, from Karl Polanyi, written in 1945 or published in that time, um, to look at the new uh, system and the role uh, of uh, market, government, uh, and civil society in this, which will come back in my presentation. Um, I think it's important to tell you that I'm not talking about whatever place. I am not a specialist whatsoever in Chinese urbanization. Um, I am not a specialist in um, uh, American cities. I would not dare to uh, make uh, claims about the countryside as a global phenomenon. I am speaking from uh, one of those typical Delta environments, um, which you see here in a uh, historical uh, map. And I always use it because it depicts uh, the territory before we enter the consumerist society and before also our paradigm of spatial transformation was in fact dominated by consumption logics, uh, consuming space. Here we have a, a synergetic uh, relationship between urbanization um, the countryside, um, water systems, fertile soils. Um, the moment that uh, a city became too big, like Ghent uh, in Belgium, uh, and the textile industry uh, was too successful. Uh, in fact, while prices were rising in Ghent, in fact, the next city, Aalst, became the new textile uh, um, uh, environment. The connections through the water uh, and later the railroads allowed for this dispersed or polycentric a city, what some um, would call the horizontal metropolis, um, or the nebular uh, city, or and so on. Uh, many words and concepts are used to describe this condition, but that is actually the, the condition or the context from which I am uh, speaking. What I am trying to talk about, um, I will go through uh, five steps, um, is in fact the first, what is our, uh, what are we confronted with? Um, I think we're confronted with a missing link and uh, this missing link is broader than uh, our practice of design, be it archi from architecture to landscape um, uh, design. It's actually a societal uh, question, but it provokes, um, it, it's a call in fact, uh, to develop new types of projects, new types of practices and new types of coalitions uh, or contexts, coalitions as in the broad sense of context within which we can work on spatial transformation. So it's maybe also commissions, uh, but um, we start from this. Um, it's a scheme we have been drawing since 2015, 16, um, out of uh, collective frustration together with many, many different actors, um, a scheme where we actually see the typical transition diagram, but broken uh, apart. Top right um, is the enormous effort that we spent um, the global society, national societies, in, for, in formulating, um, negotiating uh, ambitious goals. And that goes from the SDGs, the Climate Accord, but now the European framework from Farm to Fork, Renewable Energy 2050, the Green Deal. And if you go to every national and even every local municipality, enormous amounts of efforts are made um, to formulate the points on the horizon, yeah, what we should do. And to the left, to the bottom left, we see uh, a multitude of uh, experiments in terms of the energy transition, new food systems, uh, new mobility systems, uh, water management, um, uh, and go on with all kinds of new and different names, living lab, pilot projects, experiments, um, uh, and so on, trying to actually find a way to um, to make sure that these points on the horizon also are translated on co in concrete actions uh, on the ground. The transition logic um, or the promise of the transition diagram was that the more you experiment and you have a clear uh, point on the horizon, the closer you get to the point on the horizon. The only re really frustrating um, situation is that we are not moving closer. Um, the experiments do not add up to the points on the horizon. We are, I give an example from uh, the Delta from which I was just uh, showing an image. 
we have ambitious climate goals uh, and in terms of energy for example uh, we have an ambitious goal if we continue at this at the pace we are using now it will be between 2250 and 350 before we reach the goals for 2050. so we are um, uh, in fact uh, stuck in between the many experiments and the ambitious goals as a consequence of which the uh, societal uh, uh, commitment to reaching these goals, the moment that it's not clear how to get there, uh, it is also the moment that um, the societal commitment to, to uh, try to get there is actually vanishing. And that's what you see in politics uh, throughout the world, uh, that the, the less, uh, as, as if we don't succeed in drawing the pathway um, to these points on the horizon, then I think we really have a problem in the sense that people, uh, that negationism, a new form of negationism starts to arise the, um, uh, and starts to also uh, grow into importance. So the real question is in fact, how can we get there? Um, how can we actually not do the next experiment that is the exception to the rule? Um, how can we not write the new or draw the new plan that is a new version of what the future ought to be without knowing how to get there or seeing it as an action plan. I think that this is one of the, the crucial, um, um, let's say in a way, uh, uh, mirrors of where we stand at the moment. And it does not uh, talk or speak only to us. This is a diagram I'm using now for five years and it's recognizable for people working, for example, in the government top right that do not know how to cross this glass floor uh, and uh, see how they can land. And it's recognizable for the people busy with experiments that see they do, that do not see how to go uh, for ma mainstreaming uh, the lessons uh, learned. What is crucial in this transition diagram, and that is actually where normally on, in transition terms, we talk about changing the behavior, about the importance of political measures. But what is crucial that it also, um, uh, it's a call to us, um, from the point of view of the practice of design of transformation. Um, with a strong statement, no transitions can happen without spatial transformation. I look at the same delta. We can talk about the current uh, renewable energy production in this delta um, of the Netherlands and Flanders, Brussels, uh, parts of Germany, parts of France. We can say that we would like to produce energy in the north of Africa because that would make uh, it unnecessary to change our delta. We can then try to produce energy uh, on the North Sea. That's what we're already doing, if you look at the left diagram. But in fact, we cannot reach the goals in terms of um, uh, climate change or energy transition. Um, and the same goes for the food transition. If we do not change the physical living environment, the way we have organized the territory, its functionalities, um, if we do not change this, we can never reach those goals. Hence, no transitions without spatial transformation. Our discipline has not been very active in the field of um, uh, major societal transitions, but it is in fact a context in which we really need to be uh, active because we are the landing machine, you could say, for um, uh, those transitions. And not only the landing machine, we're also the discipline that can trans translate very abstract things, very abstract goals, um, a positive energy district, for example, I will come back to that later, to what this means for people in streets, in neighborhoods, and we can also en envision what this actually uh, delivers uh, as a positive uh, transformation for concrete living environments. So we can break up abstract, uh, vague uh, points on the horizon in workable, doable projects uh, on the ground. And I think this is a really uh, one of our key um, uh, tasks uh, for the future. And I will try to, uh, this is setting the agenda, you could say. And then the question is, how do we do this? The first uh, step I would like to take is that uh, I wrote conceiving and positioning the practice. It could also be reconceiving and repositioning the practice. Depend a bit, uh, depends a bit how you would uh, read and translate uh, uh, this. But I think it is crucial that we actually look at ourselves. We see an enormously strong practice each uh, practice individually is fragile, but if we see and structure ourselves as a practice of practices, plural, plural, we can actually contribute in a meaningful way. I will try to explain this. If you use the 
post-war, um, if you look at the, the disease of the patient, um, if planet Earth uh, is the patient, uh, or our Delta is the patient, then we um, can maybe dream, and that's also what some uh, architects clearly do, um, we can dream to be able to uh, be considered again as the doctor. Um, and you also see how here um, for the extension plans of Amsterdam, um, the gender uh, roles were organized um, with the doctor being the scientist, but in fact also um, his wife was doing uh, a lot, uh, if not more important uh, work. Um, but I don't think this is really uh, where we're heading for. And I'm, I'm using this picture because I think this is really not the model we're heading for. I think we're th we need to look at how we um, see the practice uh, of today. The evolution in terms of societal challenges we face and the dynamics uh, we see implies a diversification of um, spatial, of design and spatial practices. Um, if you look at the diagram to the right, we can see that architecture and urban design, and that's a frustration that is growing throughout the discipline um, uh, and throughout uh, Europe at least, um, um, and I guess beyond. Architecture and urban design is positioned um, uh, or separated from those who pose questions, commissioners, who have made an analysis from what is the urgency um, to what is the question posed, then there's a procedure, and then there's those who can compete uh, to produce the winning answer. Um, this is a discipline, this is a position of the discipline that is strong. It makes uh, for a really competitive uh, environment uh, within which the architecture discipline functions. It's a really commercial environment also, you could say, in which the discipline uh, functions. It leads, and I use uh, examples from my own region and from my own friends, it leads to an incredible production um, of um, uh, architecture practices. Um, and especially also the Flemish and Belgian architecture has, um, um, if I would be a bit nasty, I would say, taken over the role of the Swiss. Um, I'm not really serious when saying this, but has at least joined um, the Swiss in being very uh, important um, in um, uh, the architectural spectrum. Um, you can see this in the practices. I use some examples um, of a fantastic uh, villa project uh, here by Office Kersten Heers to the left and another one, a renovation of a former farm house um, into a, uh, nearly a gallery house um, uh, by 51 in 4E. Um, so two of the most, uh, let's say, avant-garde uh, practices uh, we know uh, as a region and as a city even, Brussels. But at the same time, what we see is that those practices um, are stuck in their parcel. They are contributing, they are producing fantastic uh, inventions, miracles in certain locations. But in a more structural sense, they are at the same time when they produce miracles, while they produce miracles, contributing to a further uh, urban sprawl, consumption of open space. Um, and they are not in the position to actually go against this. I would use it also at the scale of the city. We are looking at the situation where the consumption logic and even the, the neoliberal environment we are working in is actually determining also how we look at uh, urban design. Um, we look at those, and to the right you see the image of uh, one of the new station areas out of the Barcelona Regional uh, plan, where you could say that the urban design is very close to an Excel table, um, uh, revealing that the essence of this urban design is to find a, to make a deal between the private interests um, and hence profits and the public interests and in fact there we are locked in a, a situation when uh, where in fact urban development is uh, so close and in a way determined by private um, logics and by private public uh, partnerships um, that it maybe uh, hinders us to look at what we really have to uh, look at so my question is in fact um, is this the only relevant and pertinent societal position uh, for design as a practice? It is, it is clearly relevant in the sense that we produce fantastic miracles in not only in uh, the region from which I'm talking or the city from which I'm talking, but also in many other uh, regions. And I'm also adding the educational uh, system because I think there is really a problem with the fact that the question is often the problem, not the answers. And the question is how we get to the question. How can we intervene in, in terms of formulating the right questions so that we can also produce miracles that contribute to a more structural improvement. 
We have a second type um, uh, upon which also Paula Vigano wrote very important um, uh, books and contributes uh, qu quite a lot, for example. Um, design research or research by design or design explorations, there's several terms used, where in fact there is a kind of um, uh, uh, a kind of iterative process between possible solutions and the real underlying question. It's uh, searching for the deeper lying challenges and possible answers, and it's an iterative uh, process. This has proven to be a very successful model. If you look uh, at urban renewal, for example, in uh, and the urban renaissance in Europe, often this is prepared by such design research, where the designer is not only answering the question with a clear program, but is actually engaged in a preparatory tra track uh, leading to uh, defining, for example, in a, in a small city like Deinze, a place where um, British, uh, Belgian architects have rebuilt the, the city core, landscape architects have transformed the whole city core, and all of this is only possible because the framework for these concrete commissions was made by uh, a design research trajectory, uh, by an urban renewal uh, preparatory uh, track. So that's a, a meaningful contribution. Second, if we look at the challenges we're facing, we also see that, uh, and facing today uh, to the maximum, here we see an exploration of possible futures for the Belgian coastal landscape, looking in, inland and seaward, looking at the coastal line, but not as a line, but as a landscape. Four scenarios that deal with potential ways of um, uh, developing the urban system of the coast, um, developing the water system at the coast, the mobility system at the coast, the port economy, and trying to see this incoherence uh, developed with uh, different uh, scientists and different sciences and sectoral sciences or specialisms, you could say, but also with local and supralocal uh, entities. And if you look at this work, this is typically the work that is um, taking four years uh, in several phases to be developed, but at the same time ending up in the shelf because uh, of the fact that this type of work, uh, dealing with the future, dealing with the major challenges we face, um, and I can add part of what happens for Bruxelles 2040, uh, an exploration in terms of the future of the uh, city of Brussels, and many of these uh, um, uh, Grand Paris uh, follow-up um, uh, trajectories uh, or more landscape explorations. In fact, what you see is that the designer is positioned in a situation where the, he can, he or she uh, is asked to explore uh, the future. But the answer, in the end, there's a delivery of a report of a, of a study that assumes stable positions in society. Um, the de designer delivers a study to a commissioner with the mandate to make the next steps. And the real question is, are these clear roles still there? Is the government entity or entities commissioning such studies still in the position in our society to ma really make the next step? And the conclusion is, unfortunately, mostly not. Um, why? Because we are in a very traditional commissioner, commissioned uh, architect or uh, urban uh, consortium um, uh, working. And in fact, the mobilization of different societal actors is not happening. Um, some words here in Dutch, sorry, because the diagram was uh, older and in Dutch, but the government is no longer the only actor um, in the game. You have the societal field, uh, research experts, uh, the practice. And in fact, uh, the question is in, in a field where you, what Martin Heyer, a Dutch uh, political scientist called the energetic society, where the government still has certain uh, roles, but no longer the sole right and the sole task to really make sure that we uh, really uh, that we can deal with our uh, stru structural problems. Um, how can we actually make sure that we realize this enormous transition within and in close cooperation with a dynamic field of insights, insights, capacities, and actors? And therefore, you see, I think that there's a, a third type of practice uh, in the making. I called it um, uh, transformation as a social movement or societal movement. Um, where space is not something uh, that is used uh, to produce in the practice A, authorship, architecture, uh, where you really see uh, concrete projects uh, with clear programs. Second, design research, where you explore potential answers. But third, where you really engage in a societal dynamic and where different uh, actors have actually uh, found and developed ways uh, to mobilize uh, groups um, to structure uh, changes and to see transformation, not as something that is commissioned uh, as a design task, but to see transformation as a, as a societal process. 
not it is not because the third is the most recent development i would say uh, in which designers pick up a role that the first and the second are meaningless it is in a continuity as a practice of practices that i think this is crucial an exhibition we made in 2018 trying to show very different types of work mapping uh, the metabolic flows in a city up till uh, rotor producing uh, or let's say harvesting um, uh, deconstruction uh, material um, and making a new brand for uh, the hinges, um, uh, uh, for example, of doors, um, up till uh, projects of Robrecht and Dam that reuse uh, architects, the A architects that reuse those new types of materials. So I, there is a continuity within a broad scale of our uh, practice. Um, in the course I'm giving now um, at EPFL, I am trying to dismantle, to structure eight types um, of operations the practice is undertaking. I won't go through this, but I think we see a number of uh, practices that are not saying I'm waiting for the question to come or I'm waiting for the context that is made for me so that I can actually make the next step. We have uh, under practicing transitions, we have uh, offices throughout Europe that say the energy transition will, re will redefine our our future of our living environment and hence also our practice. The same goes for the material transition, BC architects and rotor deconstruction, for example, two practices that really say, uh, I, I have to change what I do in order to make sure I can mobilize uh, communities to make the next step. So the second is we need to reconceive. There is a process in which we reconceive the position, um, but also what the practice um, uh, uh, does and is in light uh, or in light of what we are facing. But then the question is, what is the agency of design? And can we also, and that's a, a, a huge plea or um, claim even, maybe uh, overstretching it, can we also design uh, agency? Can we provoke uh, new coalitions, as I said in the very beginning? I see there that we, as a design um, uh, practice, we have an incredible position uh, and potential to reveal interdependencies and, and possible synergies. We, we do that at the scale of concrete projects, built projects, but we can also do that at the scale of uh, larger uh, neighborhoods uh, and so on. Dependencies, interdependencies and synergies, not between spatial functions, but between societal actors. And we can enable actors to form coalitions around this. I will use the, uh, an image that I adore, uh, and I used it also yesterday in the course, um, um, of the Nile uh, Delta. Why? Because if you look at this image, it is quite clear that it is impossible to use the left um, diagram to structure this territory. Um, in this diagram, uh, the amount of population, uh, the growth of the population in this Nile uh, Valley, the presence of soil to produce food, the presence of water that Sudan does not take with the new dam, um, is all completely intertwined. If there is an, a, an incredible interdependency between the hydrological uh, natural systems, mobility and urban uh, systems, you cannot separate them. You cannot conceive even of them uh, as separate entities or fields uh, of work. And it's exactly because we do separate them um, into uh, sectoral approaches and dimensions of policy making that we uh, are unable to find the levers uh, for change, to find the the, the buttons we can turn. Um, so what we see is that uh, we have to the left a structure where we have um, uh, uh, tried to use spatial uh, planning. Um, and we see this still every day uh, while these images are still very colorful. Our contemporary plans are mostly green because it looks better. Uh, but still the separation of functionalities um, the highlighting of what is where is a crucial instrument. To the right, the city and the landscape as a metabolism, as something where, in fact, um, the input and output, what is circular, what is uh, uh, input and what is output, is a crucial element of how we look at the environment. And it is also links, linked to how we actually position um, or try to need to intervene, I think, as a practice in the typical cascade effect, uh, urbanization, takes over agriculture, agriculture takes over nature. That is the regular process because the price uh, and the profit for pro urbanization is higher than that for agriculture and nature is free uh, environment. But in fact, they hit back. And what we actually are looking for now, I think is ways to uh, steer on synergies. And I think this is a crucial uh, element to steer on synergies is crucial because if you look and now I don't show the Nile Delta, but I show a part of this Delta I am talking from. 
south of Dendermonde, a really central village between Brussels, Ghent, and Antwerp. Um, small city instead of village, um, uh, not to offend the local population. Um, but if you look at this and you draw uh, every house, but also all the protected agricultural land, the uh, green zones, the flooding areas, the public transport system, then it is very hard to see how the current logics of policy making for agriculture, for water management, for urbanization would next to one another be able to make sense. And at the same time, we really have a problem because how could we uh, organize the cooperation between all of those uh, actors? And there I think we have a role to play. Um, I said big ambitions and big goals. How can we break them down to concrete projects? Um, an example I would like to give um, is the example that started in 2013 um, with the open space offensive, um, where in fact there was a, uh, an exploration together with several actors uh, into which type of new projects uh, and also new cooperations between the urban, the natural system, uh, um, and the uh, uh, farming, uh, the open space system, could we uh, produce a presentation of uh, six different uh, possible projects for the future was uh, presented as uh, uh, diptychs and triptychs. We have a history in that, uh, in this Delta, uh, with Van Eyck and many others producing these diptychs. So together with Bovenbau uh, architecture, Dirk Somers uh, and his team, we produced these visualizations of the before and after uh, situation, provoking a group uh, uh, of policymakers, local and supra-local policymakers, to debate this and see whether indeed, as we assumed, their individual goals could only be realized through cooperation. Um, and that's exactly what they uh, confessed. We do not succeed to improve the water quality, they said, because it depends on the urbanization and the fact that we continue to uh, um, make more impermeable uh, soils. Uh, and, it con and it depends also on the farming system. And the farming system is more and more uh, in danger uh, with regards to the uh, drought uh, problems. So we see that um, we, we have an interlinkage. And only if we understand this interdependence and can find new strategies to group this together, we can make uh, the next step. The table you see in this picture was filled with people who had never met one another. The one busy with urban policy making, the other busy with um, uh, planning uh, and especially um, uh, land development for agricultural uh, purposes. Um, uh, the farming association who had met uh, with, the, with the second one, but not with the first one, and so on. So it's, it's really a question of designing um, the interdependencies that are there um, to actually see how our territory could not be a consumerist territory, but a, a form of reproductive uh, uh, territory and also no reproductive development. And what happened then is to look at uh, if we see, for example, and it's one of the examples, uh, if we see that farmers um, are working, uh, are confronted with more and more problems in terms of flooding and in terms of drought, and are actually looking uh, how they can actually make sure that they capture water in the creeks um, uh, uh, going against erosion. Um, well, that's an interesting um, consideration. That's a fact that local actors, farmers, nature organizations, municipalities are saying, we would like to work together to cope with this problem. And the interesting part, and that's also in Dutch, I'm sorry, is that this is not about generic policy making, nor about area specific policy making. We could go to this, this creek and solve the problem in this creek. But in fact, there are many places um, where farmers, water managers, um, uh, local nature organizations, uh, farmers associations, local municipalities are confronted with the same problem. Um, for example, that would be number two here. And if this is the map of Flanders, the question is how can we actually, actually steer not only on how to build a local coalition, but also a supra-local coalition um, of those policymakers that are responsible for pieces of the puzzle, but that cannot realize their individual goals without cooperation. And that's exactly what happened, where the uh, individual farmer was stuck uh, and did not find a way to engage uh, the water management authority and so on. Um, where the mayor was stuck uh, with mud flows uh, entering his uh, uh, village. Um, a group was formed uh, at the Flemish level um, under the title Operation Open Space. Um, uh, that's uh, dependent, let's say, uh, nine uh, entities amongst which uh, ourselves, but the, the, we were the exception to the rule as a cultural uh, nonprofit. The others were government entities um, saying together we will try to find a way to support local coalitions 
we will support 14 projects at once and we will make sure that we accelerate the transformation. We don't do one project area specific. We don't make a generic policy because we need to really stay in the project mode, but we will support 14 projects of which you see 12 here, uh, where in fact local coalitions stand up and say we want to contribute to the drought, not to the drought problem, but to the solution of the drought problem, uh, sorry. Uh, and we want to make sure that we uh, um, uh, make this happen. Um, what you see is there that um, an open space uh, offensive, a provocation made by uh, designers analyzing the, inter the interdependency of the different interests and, and the conflicts, um, trying to see what potential synergies could be, leads to the formation of local coalitions or enables the formation, it does not lead, but it enables the formation of local coalitions where new designers um, can step in and make the concrete landscape projects, uh, new commissions are formulated. And supra locally, a program team of uh, of entities, a new form of governance uh, at the at the, at the supra local level, where it's not about what they do uh, uh, on the locations, but how they support these uh, fourteen local coalitions. This way of working, uh, this way of uh, multiplying the changes on the ground by mandating local coalitions and supporting them by supra local entities, is provoked by uh, an, uh, these uh, diptychs, but also by cartographic atlases of where water problems interfere in what way. I'm not showing this, and is now being picked up in the Blue Deal um, for between 2018 and 2030, uh, which tries to deal with the, in the meantime, uh, uh, inc incredibly uh, uh, more important uh, drought uh, and flooding problem that farmers and and that in fact a region uh, uh, knows. So it means that we can actually use design, the agency of design is to, to reveal these synergies, but we, the agency of design is also to design agency, uh, to lead, to provoke new coalitions, to, to allow people to see that they are interdependent, not in a conflictual way, but that they can make steps uh, to, the, to, to, um, to implement new types of uh, projects. And these new types of projects, I think this is something we have to really focus uh, further on. Uh, I will use an example from Kortrijk. Um, it's a new type of, it's an exploration in a new types of projects where, um, as, in the, as was said in the introduction, uh, a city as Kortrijk was looking at the location for the new stadium, was looking at the location for the new most important programs. You could say that the drawing that I showed of Barcelona Regional um, was in the heads of the policymakers and the planners to, to draw the city through its exceptions to draw the city through the exceptional urban projects that would redefine the geography of Kortrijk. What we, what we said here, and this is the subtitle of the book, Kortrijk 2025, The City We Can Want, uh, and the sub, subtitle is Towards an Urbanism of the Everyday, um, working with uh, about 3,000 citizens and uh, different policy uh, entities of the city of Kortrijk and also of the regional entities, highlighting in fact that there are three, uh, maybe three major uh, characteristics and qualities in this environment. The fact that there's enormous presence of productive space in the city, it's called the Texas of Flanders. It's the entrepreneurial part uh, of Flanders. It's uh, mostly um, uh, a curse, but it's actually, it could be a kind of uh, um, a motto. Third, second, sorry, the, the region is, is, in, has an, is an enormously car-driven, but at the same time, the proximity is ex extremely high. And so uh, while the car is dominating uh, public space, in fact, the proximity uh, allows you to uh, reach uh, the outer, outskirts to the city center in less than 10 minutes, uh, most probably. Um, and then the landscape is also very present. And we are in the valley of the, we are in the delta, we are in the valley of the uh, Lys and the Skeld. Um, so it means that we have still remnants of creeks, but we also have uh, remnants of for landscapes that were meant to host new roads, uh, more national roads, um, sorry, more national roads, but that were not used. And so the natural and non-natural uh, artificial uh, open spaces that are there could be an essential quality uh, for this city, uh, comparing it to many other uh, cities uh, around. And what was then done is instead of drawing a, a plan where uh, new um, on the zones that were available, and so you see the major zones uh, that would become available in this city of Kortrijk, but also all the small scale um, uh, plots where development could happen. The proposal was made to actually integrate these three qualitative layers, 
the entrepreneurial nature, the proximity and the open space systems, and to see if we could produce urban magnets, uh, urban forms, figures that are not at all about um, the new uh, iconic program or urban project that would be lo located uh, next to the highway as a stadium or uh, the new IKEA uh, development uh, project uh, or the station area. Um, but that we're more, much more about how can we deal with the cooling of the city? How can we make sure that there's space for the, for the circular economy for new uh, entrepreneurial activities? How can we make sure that these types of uh, environments become the new uh, structure uh, of the city? In that sense, uh, um, a city where um, the north is more defined by the open space, the north-south axis that was already defined um, by, the, uh, by a, a, an older plan by uh, Seki Vigano, um, the, uh, the campus area where uh, industrial zones uh, and educational campuses um, uh, pr uh, provide an opportunity to move uh, further and so uh, on. But then the question is still if we have a, a different approach, a new type of project uh, approach uh, for urban um, figures, how can we actually make it happen? And there, uh, using the typical uh, types of policies that the city of uh, Kortrijk already had, namely investing in new homes. Um, they had a, their own development company building especially uh, small-scale homes, using uh, investing in uh, cycling roads. Could we make this into a new type of project, uh, a cooperation between different parts of the municipality uh, to make uh, what we call cycling uh, gates, uh, um, entry points uh, where you could enter the, the, the landscape behind um, the buildings. This is exactly in the north uh, of uh, Kortrijk, where there is a creek behind, um, where there could be a new type of quality for housing, for living, but also a completely new mobility system uh, in relation to the open space uh, that is built. Second, uh, landscape construction in the in the the uh, neighborhoods built uh, in the post-war uh, 70s, 80s. People are growing older, um, uh, are more and more alone in bigger houses, would like to move not out of the neighborhood, but yes, into uh, smaller houses. Could we find a way to uh, uh, definitely protect, or let's say for good, uh, find a protective measure for the open space system so that it's no longer subdivided in parcels and uh, urbanized? Um, that the water system can actually uh, flourish there, but at the same time that we add uh, new type of public uh, facilities, uh, new types of housing uh, types to this uh, environment. I'm going deep into two examples because they are not two examples. They are, in fact, types of projects that you need to see in a network. Um, to build those uh, uh, urban magnets, we actually, and we developed five, but there are more to be developed uh, together with the designers, the city, uh, and so on, where you, in fact, can see how the implementation um, of this big strategy does not require new stadia, but does require rethinking how you deal with the roads, how you deal with um, uh, the water management in roads, and how uh, uh, it was mentioned in the introduction. It is not about big urban development budgets. It is not about the public-private cooperation first. It is about how the roads, the implementation budget, uh, which is a yearly budget to repair and renew roads, uh, sewage systems, to maintain green spaces, how these budgets, which in the Netherlands, that's a project I will not go into detail about today, uh, adds up to 15 billion euros a year. That is the biggest budget we can spend in terms of climate adaptation of our cities, um, because that's bigger than the, the budget that is literally under climate adaptation uh, for a country as the Netherlands. Well, can we mobilize those types of budgets, those types of policymakers who are actually doing the maintenance of the past by rebuilding the past, mostly, can we mobilize those actors to build the next uh, uh, iteration of our typical urban spaces and how are then what are then these types of uh, environments so this strategy a strategy of uh, multiplication i zoomed into kortrijk to give you an urban scale but i think we are actually at the at the point in time and this is, these are images from the uh, biennial exhibition we made in the World Trade Center, which we renamed into the World Transformation Center um, in Brussels uh, in 2018, um, where we actually looked at the different transitions we are facing and how we are actually developing new types of uh, project approaches uh, for those. And I think we can actually say that uh, with all the experiments that have happened over the past years, um, the last one and a half, two decades, we are ready for a new series of projects that are not to be done in one location, but in several locations. Energy neighborhoods or districts, food parks, climate streets, water landscapes, caring neighborhoods, social catalyzers, 
circular city ports, uh, make learning hubs. These are eight of the 20 we listed. We can see out of everything that has been experimented, a new type of project that arises and in which we uh, maybe can find ways to uh, invest. The real question is then, and now I come really to the point where uh, we are uh, focusing all of our attention, let's say we are focusing our attention in defining these types of projects, but also in how we could actually mainstream such projects. Um, how can we pull insights, uh, enroll very different actors and formulate nearly investment or transformation uh, public building programs the way we knew this in the post-war rebuilding period. The great transformation as a, as a term was invented in this uh, period of complete societal upheaval. How can we actually make sure that in an energetic society, we can use the force of design to produce um, this new um, uh, movement of um, transformation? And from where can we do this? Because I think we can see the discipline as many things, as, as a commercial practice. We can see it as a cultural uh, practice. But I think we should really start to see it also as a form of uh, 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 playing a role in a civil society environment, a new midfield uh, role uh, for uh, the discipline. Um, I go back to the scheme I showed in the beginning, spatial transformation as level for uh, transitions. Um, if we look at uh, this phrase, it's for me the catchphrase of, uh, of the future. Um, we have big, uh, we have thought until the signage or the signing of the Paris Agreement that really big problems have to be solved with really big agreements and hence, uh, or furthermore, really big projects. The way we really think uh, or hope we can think that incredible water problems can be solved with incredible uh, infrastructure projects. But in fact, it is not the case. We have to change, uh, we have to go into the capillary system, uh, as uh, um, Paula uh, Viganò would uh, regularly say, go into the capillary system of our urban energy, water, food systems, and we will have to change um, uh, uh, at the root uh, of those systems. We have to change in many places. And that's exactly where we really have a problem. We are. Um, the whole society is organized in terms of consumption, in terms of scaling up, in terms of uh, facilitating large uh, solutions. But in fact, we are confronted now with the fact that we need, um, we sometimes called it before COVID, a viral transformation. That sounds really uh, problematic uh, in these circumstances uh, where a virus determines our lives. Uh, but at the same time, we really need a viral transformation. We don't need one exceptional project in one part of the water system or energy system or food system, but we need a change in every location at the same time. If we look at um, how uh, the open space platform I mentioned earlier on, I showed you the six diptychs and triptychs. Um, they produced a dynamic where several actors started working in several places. But at the same time, this is all with public money. This is all public, exceptional, um, experimental projects uh, made possible through public money. So as we, I think, can imagine that this is on the one hand very crucial, but on the other hand, very difficult uh, to maintain or to mainstream via more uh, public and only public money, we really have to find another way. And I'm looking at uh, the energy transition for a moment. Um, the European framework is clear. We will build 100 positive energy districts by 2025. And if we look at the local pilot, and here I'm looking at the work that is being done um, uh, by the Rotterdam Architecture Biennale, in which we play the role, but also many other practices, uh, Polsa Generation Energy, uh, OOS, um, uh, and Eva Pfannes, uh, together with anthropologists, uh, energy experts, uh, uh, organizational experts. Um, what you see there is, in fact, that the, the community uh, is saying we are not interested in the energy transition. We have another problem. We have a problem with poverty, security. Then if you continue, and that's what anthropologists do, um, to, if you continue questioning, they will say we have a problem with the fact that we have uh, humidity in our houses, um, uh, mushrooms uh, in our houses. Uh, we have a real problem with ventilation of our houses, um, but not the energy transition. And if you listened carefully to the last words, um, ventilation, uh, mushrooms, um, and humidity problems are, of course, part of what you could solve with the energy uh, transition. But there's a problem of language, of priority. The local government is working in these neighborhoods from different points of view, societal, socioeconomic problems, health problems, also urban development, and then next to that, the energy transition. 
um, and because it's such a difficult problem, is actually counting on the energy provider to do the work. But the energy provider who has a contract with the local government to implement a heat network is saying, I cannot show you my business case. It is totally, it's my uh, commercial secret. Um, and the resident, the only thing I'm asking to you is that the residents agree to step in because if I don't have 70% of the people stepping in into my heat network uh, system, and so moving away from the gas to the uh, heat network, uh, the heat network cannot have a, a, a closed business or a viable business case. So we are totally in a lock-in. What is strange is that an exceptional way of working, namely developing an in-between space, that's the work that the Rotterdam Architecture Biennale, uh, or the role it picked up, a cultural urban laboratory with different expertises started to see whether there is uh, a language to be found, synergies and interdependencies to be found, whether a step-by-step -step plan could be developed, and this is the work that uh, Oos, um, a Franco-German firm, uh, design firm, uh, working uh, uh, primarily on the water challenges um, uh, throughout the world, but now also on the energy transition, has developed a scheme um, for a local energy uh, action plan, doing step building step-by-step -step coalitions of actors that are ready to invest in the transformation of a part of their uh, environment. Sorry. Um, and at the same time, seeing how the public space system could also be changing uh, using the, the investments of the maintenance uh, and the renewal of public space that I mentioned earlier in uh, Kortrijk. In that way, in fact, there is a change happening. But the next question is, can we scale this up? This is the map of Rotterdam with all the neighborhoods where Rotterdam would like to do this. And again, we are actually stuck because um, how can we make, uh, how can we find a governance approach, a financial logic, um, uh, and so on that, that enables us to make the energy transition sufficiently quick, knowing that at the European scale, we said we will implement 100 positive energy districts by 2025. And there we, we again need an in-between space, uh, is our observation. We actually, uh, we have not only sprawl of uh, urbanization, but we also have sprawl um, or a dispersed uh, situation in terms of capacities, insights, tools, approaches. We have technical and financial models that could be of use to solve this problem. We have uh, governance models that have been tested in several uh, locations. We have inclusive neighborhood uh, representation and initiatives uh, in Brussels. I'm, I'm using an example now, but I could use many others. We have an exploration of the link and the, the capacity of urban development to actually facilitate the energy transition in still other cities like Vienna, Eclo, Brussels, uh, and I'm using only some examples. We have digital um, impact uh, uh, or startups who start to develop online platforms for local, eco local communities to share energy with one another. If you have a southern oriented roof so that you can produce energy, not only for yourself, but also in an, uh, contribute to the, to the neighborhood uh, system. But what is typical of our contemporary situation is not only uh, sprawl in our spatial uh, system, but also sprawl of capacity. If we do not add this up, if the financial system and the governance model does not allow to act um, in uh, each of those um, uh, neighborhoods at the same time, we will never, never be able to accelerate and we will also never um, be, move beyond the exceptional nature of an experiment uh, in terms of uh, a neighborhood. So the question is, how do we do that and why should we do it? Because, and that is quite clear, if we would do that, and now I'm really going outside of my uh, expertise field, but we are, uh, I will show you why I'm doing this. We are reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, we are creating new jobs. In Belgium alone, the renovation and uh, uh, energy production uh, in neighborhoods would be a, a kind of investment project or a re represent a budget that's maybe better of 200 billion euros, 40 to 50,000 euro per house, uh, and then you can count. That generates an enormous employment um, uh, project, increases the health, reduces the energy bill, increases the living and working comfort, and there where we now have uh, derelict houses which we could feed with renewable energy, uh, which would leak as they leak today, uh, we would have in fact revalued the patrimony, uh, not the patrimony in the sense that uh, Filippo will talk about it in a moment, but the, the, the housing stock, uh, everything we have, the built stock uh, of houses we have. How can we move further? Uh, the experiment of the great transformation we are launching now is an attempt to break through the frustration we, uh, we and others uh, uh, sense. And that is that um, if we cannot add up the, the types of knowledge, but also the roles 
of what the government, the private sector, civil society can pick up if we cannot add up the logics and the insights of very different stakeholders to draw a transformation program, an acceleration program, then we will remain stuck uh, between the many experiments that are all in itself extremely beautiful, uh, energy demanding and consuming, mostly subsidy uh, uh, consuming, but in, in the end, um, a drop uh, um, in a big sea. Um, we need to find a way to accelerate um, uh, and accelerate not by increasing the scale and going towards a big scale solution, but by multiplying. The next big thing will be a lot of small things. Um, we can, around each of those, local municipalities are uh, making, for example, in Belgium, every local municipality is now making a food strategy. But there's not yet, uh, and every of these municipalities, sorry, is in the process of commissioning uh, an energy study. But in fact, we already know which types of projects we need to implement. We don't know, we, don't, we should not see it as a recipe, but we, sh we should see it as a reservoir of approaches um, a, a new uh, rebuilding program or transformation program that mobilizes the capacity of investment of citizens, of private uh, bonds and or public bonds, um, to actually move into the next uh, step. For the climate streets, we need to mobilize the 15 billion euros, uh, and that's also an image of the trajectory we're having in the Netherlands, moving towards a city deal to spend these 15 billion euros wiser in the climate adaptation, social improvement um, of public spaces in the Netherlands. So we have recurrent projects or strategic projects, uh, the, the Grand Chantier in French. Uh, this is impossible to translate in, in English, I think. We have these uh, big um, projects which we could invest in, to make sure that we transform uh, at once our economic system, our living environment, our natural uh, and physical environment, um, uh, our social uh, system, make sure that we uh, have caring uh, neighborhoods uh, and so on. We are in the process of being able of naming what those types of projects are, but we have to find a way to make a next step. And hence the, the grouping, the partnership, the mobilization of forces um, around the great transformation is an attempt to build a knowledge library what have we done? What is the dispersed knowledge? Can we bring that together? To set up an incubator, um, you could say, and I'm now using deliberately slang from the innovation, uh, uh, economic, mostly innovation environment, to say we need to couple these different types of knowledge to, to decide the next steps and to have investment programs. And at the same time, if we talk from the point of view of the solution, and we talk to the population, as we saw in Rotterdam, the energy neighborhood is the solution for you. The response will be no. So we need also an enrollment. Uh, we need also a kind of public movement, a societal movement uh, around these uh, transformations. And that is actually, um, uh, I would say yesterday, I used a very nasty word, but I will use it again. It's the mindfuck, uh, I think, we are confronted with together, where the question is, can we as designers, by being able to name possible interdependencies and synergies, enabling coalitions to be formed, developing practices in the direction of what we really have to do, step out of our current uh, uh, role, um, uh, step out of our current role where we more and more, the more complex the world becomes, the more we retreat in our own discipline, you could say, looking back at our own canon and history, at our own formal language, taking away the context and the societal environment in which we work. Uh, and that goes both for the, the planning of the exceptional urban projects and for the architecture discipline that is working in the framework of a commissioned uh, environment and competing for the best answers that is less and less in, enabled to participate in this uh, broader environment. We really need a, a midfield uh, uh, place where we can actually uh, work in between uh, the, the individual experiments and the ambitious goals, at least that is my analysis, but it's also my question uh, to you later uh, today, whether this is true. Um, that was my testimony of how uh, the past uh, about uh, 10 years were a discovery um, uh, or a kind of safari um, to explore how the design discipline could contribute to answering societal challenges how therefore we would, we would need to maybe reconsider what space uh, is and reposition the, the importance of space, uh, not by claiming it and saying it should be that like this, but, and then I go to the end of the, the third uh, sentence, but by finding a way to engage 
in a societal, in a broader societal movement um, uh, uh, that is actually also taking place and by finding a way to actually accelerate by multiplying uh, around new types of uh, projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your lecture. Maybe I'll go there. <laughs> Thank you very much for your lecture, Joachim. Um, it is really, uh, it's not only a statement, but really you have expressed a position and a program for um, a design and transition um, as you, you show yourself. And, uh, but at the same time, a designer and a researcher. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we are going to listen to Filippo De Pie, and uh, I think that you are uh, making, um, making us jump into uh, another time, <laughs> another place, another dimension. But uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, the relation will be uh, absolutely uh, evident in the end of the, of the lecture. Uh, Filippo De Pieri, um, he, is, uh, um, an he teaches uh, architectural history at the Politecnico di Torino. Uh, he is an architect and uh, he is uh, particularly specialized um, on the history of 19th and 20th century city and also urbanism. Um, he has particularly focused on uh, social histories of housing and planning and on the intersection between uh, scholarly research and public narratives. Um, I, I, I'd like to mention the fact that um, Filippo has been a guest scholar here at EPFL some years ago. Uh, it was a, uh, a moment where he developed a research on La Chaux de Fonds with some scholars here, uh, Laurence Fraser Vido in particular, uh, and Dr. Schiffler. Um, Nicola Bergheri also, uh, Yves Pedrazzini, so it was also a, well, Ibefel had, uh, could, could in fact uh, take advantage uh, a lot of your presence here. So thank you, uh, Filippo, the floor is yours. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena, for this presentation and for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I hope that the connection works and that you can hear and see me well, okay, then there is a, another thing I have to do, which is to try to share my screen. Let's see if we manage to do this. Sounds like, okay, can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes, yes. So thank you very much once again. Uh, my presentation will be very different from Joachim de Klerk's. Uh, I really appreciated his presentation and uh, we play the game of contrast today. Uh, the, there is an inherent risk in uh, um, giving a conference series the title Scholars in Transition and the risk is uh, of pushing scholars towards autobiography. And uh, it is a risk I will take today. So I have to apologize first because there will be some elements of autobiography in my presentation uh, or rather of self-reflection, which we can say. I'm not particularly prone towards autobiography and uh, I am going to propose you some uh, considerations taken from my personal itinerary, not because I believe to be particularly interesting as a scholar, but because I believe there are a few interesting things to be observed in my personal trajectory as an example of a trajectory of a scholar of my generation within the field of urban history and uh, planning history. Um, the, what I will present you now will have a double, um, a double focus. Uh, on the one hand, there will be a focus on the study of 19th century planning. And on the other hand, there will be a focus on research trajectories, on our own research trajectories. Um, can our research experience be uh, imagined as a linear process? Uh, certainly not. Uh, how can it be uh, represented? Uh, is it a, a rather a circular process as my conference might suggest? Uh, I don't know, but uh, I will show you uh, what my kind of very personal, but also very, very curious experience with uh, some um, parts of, uh, with the study of the 19th century plans. Uh, the, um, 
the, the introduction that Elena made of my work is perfect because it gives you the final destination point of my presentation. The starting point would be probably slightly different. Basically, I will move between two extremes that I'm presenting to you right now as a sort of introduction to the starting and the final point, but uh, actually the starting point is possibly a starting point. The final point is definitely not a final point of my uh, presentation. So uh, this is a 19th century plan, a mid 19th century plan. It, it was called the general plan of expansion for the city in which I live, um, which is uh, Torino, uh, on which I uh, carried out a PhD thesis uh, some time ago. It was uh, discussed 20 years ago, actually, in 2000. Um, and uh, so this is the starting point from which I will move. And the provisional arrival point is this thing that is certainly more familiar to you, this particular plan, which is the plan drafted by Charles-Henri Junot, by engineer Charles-Henri Junot for La Chaux de Fonds in uh, 1835. This date is uh, uh, a bit inaccurate, but we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, these two urban plans have uh, a few things in common. They, also, they are also partly different. I'm not going, they are, of course, uh, different in some morphological terms, but I'm, I'm not going to enter into a morphological analysis of the choices made for, for these plans. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they also have a few things uh, in common. First of all, they are closer in time than they appear. This uh, plan is often uh, thought of as a plan for 1835. This one, sorry, I'm going back, dates officially from 1852. Actually, they are basically two planning documents from the 1840s, so they are very close in time. And they also have a certain um, uh, air family feeling, let's say, because the way in which they were presented, the documents that went with them, the graphic style, a certain way to think about the city, uh, had a number of things in common. Um, they also belong to a family of urban expansion plans that were drafted for post-Napoleonic European cities during the first half of the 19th century. So if I tell you that my uh, itinerary as a researcher started, let's say, in the late 90s by studying this particular plan and that a recent arrival point is this other particular plan, you might imagine that maybe I'm a hyper-specialized scholar in the history of early 19th century plan, which is partly the case, but not entirely the case, actually. The fact is that uh, actually, uh, after doing my PhD thesis on that particular period of the history of a European city, I decided that I also wanted to move somewhere else. And I, I did a number of other experiences in urban research. Um, so that uh, actually my, uh, the fact of returning to early 19th century planning recently with the study of the UNESCO site of La Chaux de Fonds for me is rather a, a return to something that I have done after having uh, explored a number of roads. So it looks to me like a sort of circular movement, a paradoxically circular movement, by which I'm sort of, I, I found myself sort of moving back to square one, uh, observing objects that were very similar from very different perspectives. And uh, what I will tell you uh, today is about uh, uh, why the perspectives have become so different, what has changed in the meantime, and which are the potential implications of this personal change, which is also a change in perspective. So let's start from the, the starting point, let's say, that the plans I was talking earlier. This is a, an archaeological document, let's say. Uh, it dates from the mid 1990s. Uh, I think these things were made from my master thesis, actually, when I was already working on this 19th century plan, Italian plans or North Italian plans. And these are the transcriptions of archival documents, the manual transcriptions of archival documents that I was doing at the time. Um, I already had a computer, uh, but the, the computer was at home. It was not that obvious to bring a computer in archives at the time. So uh, this uh, thing you're seeing here is the result of a curious mix of technologies. Um, at some point I had decided that I needed papers of a certain size with a, cer uh, with a certain type of lines in order to write quickly and easily. So I did one thing. I printed these sheets of paper, these empty sheets of paper at home on my computer. And then I went in the archives and hand wrote the transcriptions on the document on that. This is not particularly interesting, if not because it measures some kind of technological change that is affecting our research in different fields over time. And it tells you something about uh, 
certain shifts in ways of observing document, ways of observing and treating sources, also different kinds of velocity in research. This was a very, very slow process. I'm now working at a much faster pace with digital photography and other documents. It also measures some kind of uh, change in the attitude towards research. The, the, the fact that actually I never shown uh, such a picture to anyone in my life, I guess. Uh, at the time when I was studying this plan, I didn't consider this kind of uh, uh, elements of information to be relevant for what or what I was doing. While today it's obvious to me that the fact that uh, my, my way of treating document passed through this kind of practices was relevant for what I was doing. So this, is, this already tells you something about some changes of attitude towards research. But why was I doing all that? Why, that, why I was doing this crazy thing and uh, transcribing documents from 19th century archives? Um, and uh, um, requiring photographic copies of documents from archives, also duplicating images of plans was a difficult thing. Uh, I could occasionally bring a camera with me in the archive, but only uh, it was very difficult to actually use it. Sometimes you, you asked for photographs uh, from the archives, sometimes uh, uh, I made hand draft copies of the drawings myself in order to make sense of the changes. Um, which was the, uh, the my, I had a question to pose to these plans. And uh, uh, I had a number of questions, but let's say the basic question was about their nature as planning documents or not. The question was, uh, are, can these plans from the, these are all from the 1840s, can these plans actually be treated as planning documents mm, in, the, in, the, in the sense of, of uh, late 19th century and early 20th century urban planning? The literature that existed on those plans had actually treated them very much as planning documents in the 20th century sense of the words. So as documents that try to anticipate the future, to build a normative uh, context for the expansion of the city, uh, to organize future development of the city uh, within a certain uh, ideological uh, context. Uh, my uh, impression was that uh, uh, in this interpretation of these documents, there was a central degree of anachronism, mm, that uh, uh, there was only a certain measure until which it was possible to project on these documents, planning categories, urban planning categories that had been elaborated over the course of the 20th century, and that there were uh, other ways in which these documents tended to escape this kind of representation. There was something else in these plans that demanded to be uh, understood. So my questions was not just, were not just local, they had to do with the history of planning, with the history of urban planning, and the extent to which a number of early 19th century planning documents could be considered as predating or anticipating the birth of invention of urban planning as a discipline, and to what extent, on the other hand, they needed to be understood in other terms as belonging to their own time in a different perspective. This was the, the question. And in order to do so, I explored archives, I read correspondence. My thesis was not just about drawings, actually drawings were the starting point, but not the center of my analysis. I went through archives, correspondence. I tried to understand the strategies that were behind these plans, the actors that were involved, the interplay of people and institutions. This resulted in a book that I published in uh, 2005. Um, so my conclusion was that yes, this was this could not be understood as a plan in the late 19th century sense of the word, but rather as a, a series of documents that uh, had to be understood in uh, within the a specific context of institutional conflict, of changing attitudes toward land exchange, uh, but also within the context of the persistence of certain land practices that belong rather to ancien regime cities. So they were they belong to a society that was really somehow in between, not in the sense that it anticipated something, but in the sense that the temporality of the society was rapidly changing and the temporality, the ambiguous temporality of these documents reflected this change. Um, let me just say before moving on that I, uh, it is still the, the book that resulted from this and my PhD thesis and all this work is something I, I'm really proud of still today. I think it was a good work. I think the book still holds uh, to, to, to some further scrutiny. Um, but on another level, 
uh, I have developed over time a certain distance uh, as uh, within against, let's say, this um, this work. Um, I wouldn't, if I were to do the same thing today, I wouldn't do it the same way, not because the time has passed and technology has changed, but also because uh, probably my approach to archives was somehow positivistic in its approach in some ways. I really believe that by reading every document and understanding every possible source, I wouldn't be able to actually understand the degree of rationality that was behind these documents and somehow to decipher these mysterious things that needed to be uh, understood somehow. I don't believe this is possible anymore, let's say. Uh, and uh, so uh, I have a conflictual relationship with this uh, work of which I am proud. On the one hand, I wouldn't do it again in the same way. On the other hand, the myself, the scholar in the past that was myself in uh, around 2000, did a very good job starting from these wrong premises. So maybe these wrong premises were not that bad. I'm not sure about uh, what I should think about this. But the fact is that uh, not even after concluding this, but before concluding this, I had already started to move on, to move on towards doing a number of other things, possibly because I was basically unable to develop some kind of strong specialization, or possibly because I wanted to understand things from different points of view. Uh, so starting from, uh, uh, actually before this book was published, I already started to do a few different things. Uh, and I'm moving through a number of them because I think that this kind of uh, uh, time travel that I'm proposing to you has something to say about the, the ways in which I am returning, I have been returning to the topic recently. So first of all, there was this, uh, for, uh, it was already before the publication of the book, this was my intro, my, I, I basically, um, decided that I want to uh, study more of the 20th century history of architecture. And one of the first thing I did was uh, studying the history of conservation planning of historic city centers in Italy and elsewhere with a special interest for their representation. Here is an example of an article I wrote with a colleague in 2004 about the historical city center of Bologna around the time of the conservation plan of 1969 and with an insistence of the ways in which the, this, uh, the, the historic city center of Bologna had been represented, particularly in visual terms at the time of the plan, the types of narratives, of visual narratives that went together with this conservation plan and a similar and more recent uh, attempt that focuses on Astengo and the Carlo, um, the, an insistence, a study of the historical narratives that went together a number of, of very well-known conservation plans in Italy uh, between the 50s and the 60s. So an interest for historic cities from the point of view of their representation, an interest in the public rhetorics about the past history of cities that was developing in this work. This was a time in which I really started to think that the public uh, use of historical narratives was a relevant topic to be observed within in 20th century architecture. Uh, and then another long experience I probably should mention in order to make sense of a number of changes that have happened uh, has been my experience of housing, his historical housing studies, which have uh, uh, this, this big book as a sort of reference point. This, uh, this book was a collective endeavor that we published in 2013. It was called Storia di Case, Stories of Houses. And it was a sort of a collection of micro histories of anonymous residential complexes built in Italy between the 1950s and the 1970s. It was not a typological study of those buildings. Um, Joachim was talking about a lot of small things uh, before. Well, this was a micro historical study of some small things that belong to a lot of small things, to an anonymous landscape of uh, uh, the dense periphery of Italian cities. Um, I'm mentioning this, first of all, because it was uh, my first experience of actually uh, entering the topic of residential buildings as uh, parts of the city. So as the city being made up of residential buildings and uh, I went, I came from urban studies and from urban history and I sort of re-entered the topic from a different perspective, which was the perspective of housing environments as starting points in order to understand uh, a city. And there were a few other experiences connected to this. Uh, um, let's say research thread I have been developed for, I have been developing for some time. I'm actually still in the field uh, right now. 
um, first of all, the role of oral histories of memory, which did not feature prominently in my previous research, and it became a major ingredient of some of my work starting with this experience. We were working with oral historians. We actually somehow learned how to do, how to carry out oral research in the proper way. These micro histories of building were really part, were partly based on archives and on traditional ways of making architectural history, but they were also based on oral histories very much, especially some of these uh, uh, stories. So the idea that memories and uh, personal experiences of urban change were an important part of the understanding uh, of uh, 20th century history, not in a sentimental sense, but because they gave access to a number of perspectives uh, on urban change that other approaches did not allow to, um, to, to reach. Um, third point I want to stress about this particular experience is the intersection between different scales of observation, which was a major, uh, a major point in this kind of uh, research. This is a different research I undertook on a um, on, a, on a housing complex in central Italy, the Villaggio della Nebbiara in Reggio Emilia, which is a, a super interesting case study. I'm not telling anything about this right now, but uh, the, the point in the previous studies I showed you and uh, these this kind of things I've been doing more recently is actually really to find case studies and to find the research strategies that allow to build a connection between the micro histories of specific places and uh, broader scales of observation. So uh, ways in which uh, the, the, um, the, the close study and the situated study of a specific uh, uh, building can allow to understand something, something about broader processes of city transformation. In this case, for example, the village uh, was uh, really at the center of a broader urban plan that was drafted just a few years before, three years before the village was completed. The people that lived in the village and the authors of the plan were the same people. Planner Osvaldo Piacentini first built this village for himself and the cooperative of people around him in the late 1950s. And then in 1962, he was responsible for the residential housing plan of all the south sector of the city and his village was at the center. So it tells something about also an intersection of professional histories that are that is quite interesting to be observed. And this interplay of scales of observation is one of the, the things I have learned to do in these residential histories. One of the things why housing histories are so interesting for me, not because they talk of domestic spaces, but because they talk of how impossible it is to limit the scale of observation to just one small object or one broad process, but everything is interrelated somehow. Um, Fourth point, fourth important point I need to mention about this is the fact that um, very early in the process, actually, uh, this experience in housing histories confronted me with how important the public narratives are and can be in this kind of stories. This had already partly sur surfaced in my research on historical cities, uh, as you saw, but uh, when studying houses and when studying the experience that people had of housing, the way in which housing had been the first experience of mediation between some people, some new inhabitants and the city, one realized to what extent these histories had a public relevance and the public negotiation of, uh, collect of histories and collective memories could be a strategy for understanding them. And so the, this interest for the public dimension of historical research, not, the, not just the scientific dimension of historical research, has become stronger uh, in my work over recent years. Sometimes I have been uh, explicitly uh, chasing, let's say pursuing this goal uh, in the left side uh, image here. Uh, you see an example of this for the Venice Biennale, the Colas Biennale in 2014. We organized a weekly event that took place in the Biennale, which was called Calling Home, in which what we did was basically to call through Skype some people that were living in their homes. We had selected a series of case studies, and the, these people had half an hour, just like us today, uh, to tell something to the public about the house in which they lived in. They couldn't move the camera, so we only saw them uh, with a fixed uh, uh, screen, but they described what was around them. They tell, they told tales about their experience. So it was a way to publicly present a personal memory so as to turn it into a, 
a collective endeavor. Uh, and it also speaks somehow to our present condition in which everything happens through Zoom and through Skype. But by the time it was not that usual, let's say. Um, and also and sometimes this kind of public presentation has just come back to me at totally in totally unexpected ways. This is a, the, in the right picture. Well, that's myself, of course, that's myself visiting the village de la Nebbiara, which was the topic of the previous article I showed you, because at some point after the publication of my studies on the topic, the people that were living in the Nebbiara organized uh, in connection with the municipality, a series of public visits to the neighborhood in which I, I discovered that they were distributing my article as a sort of guidebook to the place. And then they, invite me, they invited me to see their houses once again. So it was a strange connection between myself as a scholar and myself as, as the, uh, unknown protagonist of, a, of an event of public history or public sharing or co of collective memories. Um, and then, of course, I should mention China. It's impossible not to mention China, but only because it was at a certain point part of my personal itinerary and also because China is uh, uh, everywhere these days. And one of the changes that belong to the story is the fact that we have all become globalized somehow as scholars, it's been just impossible to think even of our, of our very local topics, if not in strictly global terms or in terms that have changed with the uh, development of studies on globalization. But uh, I was in China uh, a few times between 2014 and 2015 uh, doing uh, as, a, as a guest scholar in Tsinghua University and doing together with a group of people a research on the so-called down way of uh, um, Chinese uh, socialist city, especially in Beijing. The book that you see was the was a result of that. So it was about the, the residential and service landscape uh, built uh, in uh, the years of the socialist heyday and the persistence of some parts of this landscape in contemporary uh, Beijing. I'm mentioning this because it is a, a first example of circularity. I was coming uh, from uh, my recent studies on housing, housing in contemporary Italian cities. I had developed a few techniques of observation. I found myself basically trying to do the same things in a totally different context in which actually sources were very different, approach to the topics was very different. Uh, it was almost impossible to do the same things in the same way, but still the research questions partly overlapped. I discovered myself, I discovered that some of the instruments that I had developed from my previous studies were actually very useful or, or seem to be very useful, who knows, within the context of these particular cities. And I'm mentioning uh, this particular experience also for another reasons, because it was one of those lateral experience, experiences that produced uh, uh, a seemingly casual encounter then that brought me to, to Switzerland, actually, and to the, and after a while to the EPFL. Uh, sorry, the date is wrong. It's not uh, 2005, but 2015. So it, this is not a Roberto Bolaño book. It is my personal experience. And uh, um, among the many people that I met during that Michele Bonino and I met during our work on China uh, were a few people from the PFL, among which for Florence Gazzabido, Yves Pedrazzini, and other uh, friends and scholars that uh, from with which we have worked uh, in the meantime, and China became uh, an initial uh, terrain of exchange for a number of research experiences uh, for which memory actually became at some point a central uh, keyword. So that um, if we move the reel on, uh, uh, here we are two years after that, three years of the, pub the publication of the yellow book on China that you saw, and here we are, left image with Florence Grezel Bidot and a number of other people and PhD students coming from both Polytechnico di Torino and the APFL organizing a joint seminar that took place in early 2017, a joint seminar on urban memory called Memory and the City that witnessed the participation of a number of PhD students from both institutions. It was a theoretical seminar uh, based on the exploration of a number of texts and recent researches on the subjects. And from then, actually, Florence and I and the group and together with a number of other colleagues uh, went on developing a research project. The idea behind the project was also called Memory in the City. The idea behind the project was to uh, dedicate some time to the study of urban memory. And actually, uh, this was not meant to become uh, uh, a project on Swiss cities uh, like La Chaux-de-Fonds. 
actually our initial idea behind the project was to put together more of a theoretical project, a sort of uh, to build a series of encounters and seminars to sort of make the point about the state of the studies of urban memory, uh, which was the theoretical knowledge about those, which were the recent research experiences uh, carried out worldwide, and how could these studies advance in, in some way. But then for one of those shifts that sometimes happen in individual and collective research, at some point in one of our first meetings, one of our colleagues proposed that maybe it was boring just to do this and maybe we needed a case study. Our initial idea was not to have a case study, but then the, the idea of the case studies popped up. That why don't we work on the UNESCO site of La Chaux de Fonds and Le Locle? Why don't we work on working class memory in the sites and memory of the industrial production and memory of watchmaking production? Uh, we explored the site. Uh, I personally had never been to, to those cities, so went there. We sort of wandered around trying to trying to understand whether this was a feasible idea or not. And we were immediately conquered, actually. We immediately decided that this was a way to go. And actually, one of the reasons why we decided that this one was definitely a way to go was precisely the fact, at least I am talking for myself, I'm talking for my personal experience, that this place immediately somehow brought to the surface a number of things that were in my background that were very distant in time sometimes or sometimes were closer in time um, that uh, some, at some sort of chemical reaction with what I was observing in uh, the place. So I found myself observing promotional videos like the one shown in Le Locle in the Espace Temps et Urbanisme um, with uh, uh, an attention for the ways in which the historical city was represented the way in which the role of residential buildings and the architectural typologies was conceptualized, and the way in which the long-term develop, um, development of uh, a watchmaking region in terms of both cultural um, production culture and urban form was systematically uh, brought back to the origins of that movement in 19th century planning. So there, a bell started to ring, and uh, within the space of one or two months, I found myself like there. Uh, going back to archives, going back to 19th century documents, not in, not in uh, the cities I knew, but in the Swiss cities, uh, still with the uh, checking a, a number of documents concerning the, this particular 19th century plans that the UNESCO side considered as founding uh, moments of what the UNESCO site was called in watchmaking town planning. You know that the label uh, behind the UNESCO inscription of the twin cities of Le Locle and La Chaux-de-Fonds is urbanisme horloger. Uh, the hypothesis behind that is that there is some kind of strong connection between urban form on the one hand and the historical development of watchmaking production on the other hand, and that 19th century urban planning had precisely a role in sort of fine tuning this mutual agreement between production and space. So uh, I found myself going back to the documents and trying to understand more about these particular plans, asking myself, is it true? Or which is the degree of truth of this particular claim? Maybe there is certainly some degree of invention or uh, of slogan in this, but to what extent uh, do documents and available sources support this kind of vision? So I went back to the documents, uh, written documents um, that always had this sort of family feeling. They were written exactly in the same calligraphy on the same types of paper with the same ritual and the same words that they found often in the French speaking document that they had been seen 25 years before in my Turin archives. Uh, and sometimes the, um, the, the link was so, uh, seemingly immediate that I found myself really posing the same questions to some of the documents. For example, back in 2000, when I was studying uh, North Italian plan, expansion plans for early 19th century city, one of my interests was for the materiality of planning documents. We often saw planning documents through photographs, but actually one thing I learned very early was the plans were material objects. They were very rare, only just, often just one copy existed of fundamental drawings. So these drawings had become some sorts of palimpsests, palimpsest, sorry, they were passed on from hand to hand. They were changed over time. Uh, and uh, when one learned how to decipher a document 
it was actually very difficult to uh, to make a distinction between the different strata that could be found on the on a document or sometimes be, be, between the different variations and the la chaux de fond plan uh, the, the the 1835 plan for la chaux de fond actually presents similar problems uh, the original document is actually lost although the unesco nomination um, documents never tell you this, but the original drawing is not there. We only know the plan through a series of engravings from the 1840s where, that are quite different one from another, but sometimes in small details, but they are different one from another. And they also have a number of uh, additions here and there uh, of which, for which it's difficult to actually find a precise um, chronology. So it is a quite a complex document. The, the history of this document is much more complex than it appears. And one of the surprising things about the UNESCO process is that actually the construction of the nomination has not brought to any specific study about the, uh, the genesis of this plan and its articulation in time. So I found myself posing to this document some, some questions that had, I had already been posing to other documents 20 years before, possibly because these were the right question to pose, or possibly just because I was just repeating myself. I was just uh, in a path dependency uh, modality that brought myself to uh, somehow uh, uh, pose without even thinking a number of questions to, the, to these objects uh, because I had already posed them to some other objects in the past. Who knows? I'm still doubtful about this. Maybe there were better questions to pose to this document that did not came to my mind because I was still somehow re-evoking uh, my previous experiences in the field. Um, so um, I ended up, uh, not really ended, but um, the, I ended, the outcomes of this have been many, not just one. Uh, the main outcome is still has, has yet to see the light. It is a book that we're doing together, together with Florence and other colleagues, and other colleagues, both from the Polytechnic Greater Union and the APFL on La Chaux de Fonds Le Locle as a UNESCO site in which we explore some of its uh, uh, projects. The book is uh, set to see the light uh, next year. Hopefully we will present it at some point at the APFL, so I'm not anticipating much more. But let's say there are at least two directions in which this has gone, and these two directions are not entirely coherent one with each other. So if we talk about transition, we should talk also about bifurcations here, potential bifurcations of what we do. Um, one potential direction is the critical view of what I have been seeing. So this is this article that I published last year uh, on a hi planning history journal. So I sort of rediscovered my roots as a planning historian uh, is uh, uh, an interpretation of the critical side of this question in public histories of urban planning. Uh, my conclusion in my studies of the Junot plan was that to assume that this document had been had served as the foundation stone for this uh, uh, pretended coherence between watchmaking production on the one hand and urban planning on the other hand was too much. My opinion was that actually this plan needed to be read at least partly in different ways, that the views defended by the UNESCO nomination were, were not really supported by documents. And that one of the, the questions to be reminded both to scholars and to the public was that actually there were a number of other interesting questions regarding these territories that the plan posed and that the UNESCO process had somehow left in the background. So brought out of the conversation and that, that maybe should be brought back. For example, the fact that uh, the history of watchmaking from, uh, of watchmaking in the local La Chaux de Fonds is not an urban history as the UNESCO site seems to suggest, but is rather uh, a, a history which is really based on the intersection between the urban and the rural and on the intermediate nature of these territories which were no less rural than they look, can look today as urban. But I'm not going to develop this. But so this is the critical point of view, sort of uh, taking, uh, uh, assuming the pose of the 19th century planning expert, observing documents and somehow criticizing, if not occasionally demolishing some public narratives concerning these plans that look, let's say, disappointing to say the least, um, which was actually, uh, not a very difficult task in this particular case. Um, but there is also the other face of the medal, which was already partly suggested here, but which I'm um, coming to think more often right now, because it is true that uh, watchmaking and planning narratives were quite disappointing, actually. But uh, on second thought, uh, I also 
remain with the feeling that uh, although the um, the hypotheses behind the UNESCO nomination of La Chaux de Fonds were not demonstrated, still the questions were interesting. To pose a specific question between the link uh, about the links between urban planning, uh, watchmaking production, and the organization of urban space was an interesting thing to do. Uh, this kind of uh, research questions needed to be developed. And actually, there was something good in this UNESCO nomination because it had, had, it had brought back to public attention uh, a theme concerning the history of La Chaux de Fonds, Le Locle, and possibly other European cities that planning historians as professional historians had somehow neglected in the recent past. So once again, I find myself divided between on the one hand, seeing the critical side of this and uh, the superficial side of the public use of history that UNESCO sites make. And on the other hand, seeing the potential that these public narratives hand, have for inspiring new lines of research in topics that somehow we tend to take for granted. So for example, I found myself recently writing a, a thing about the comparison between La Chaux de Fonds and Le Locle on the one hand, and the other hand, Nice, which is presently in the process of presenting a UNESCO nomination, a UNESCO listing request for the site of the city presented as Capital du Tourisme de Riviera, uh, the idea that uh, Nice should enter the World Heritage List because it is the quintessential maritime touristic city, and it was the city that somehow invented touristic developments on the seaside. And Nice is doing this by, um, by developing the idea that, once again, early 19th century planning, you won't be surprised, contributed to shaping this uh, seaside tourism uh, side. Um, so this really brought me back to square one somehow, because uh, the, 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 the urban plans that are, that are the starting point and the reference point for this application uh, are, are actually urban plans that were drafted in the first half of the 19th century by very much the same institutions that I was studying 20 years ago, because Nice was part of the cyber warrior state before 1860. So everything was made uh, following the, the models coming from Torino but inflecting these models in totally different directions in the sense that the idea was not to regulate urban expansion, but to use urban expansion in order to promote touristic activity. And once again, uh, my impression is that maybe there are some flaws in this interpretation and not uh, it, it remains to be seen to what extent uh, urban institution in the uh, first half of the 19th century were really uh, busy with promoting touristic activities uh, or um, uh, the presence of foreigners in the city, but still the question is a good question, is a question that deserves further investigation. So once again, we are facing uh, a public history exercise which is not promoted by historians, it's, it, it is promoted for other reasons, that are very good things to say to planning historians, and that poses the problem of a potential, um, uh, of how to create a potential meeting point between public histories of cities on the one hand, and specialized planning and urban histories of cities on the, on the other hand, between scientific history of cities and planning and public uses of planning history, which are increasingly frequent in our cities. This is not really a conclusion. It's more of a step in something that is not a development. It resembles to some sort of increasingly circular development, incessantly returning to what one has been doing and occasionally finding some surprises and I have no idea or where this will go next, apart from the debate that will follow now. Thank you. Well, thank you to both and thank you to all who are here and who are participating online. I think it's so fascinating to see the two of you bringing these, um, as you characterize them yourself, sort of counter positions in a way. And um, I'm really struck by some of the commonalities uh, that you touched upon. One of these being, I guess it was um, a famous mathematician who once characterized the difference between 19th century mathematics and 20th century mathematics as being the difference between uh, groups of numbers and groups of groups of numbers. <laughs> so your, your uh, practice of practices, I think this idea of system of systems is very relevant. And finally, 
you're dealing with movements, as you say, these are social movements that we're dealing with. So we have increasingly, you use the term bifurcated, we have increasingly diverse uh, voices we're trying to uh, bring on board with this. And I wanted, I was really struck by this idea, especially as we're here in the context of the PhD programs, and they have similarities, once again, they have some differences. And it really struck me the continuity in your practice, uh, Joachim, uh, is what I saw at the Berlache Institute around the time that you were there, where this was really, you, you uh, referred to Paula and her work with research by design, but to, I first experienced it at the Berlache, where there were these, there was the idea that you, you bring pedagogy and practice and policy together in a very explicit way. And uh, this is touching also, I think, on this idea, what you call uh, transformation social movements is similar to your idea of the great transition. And it reminds me of what uh, Fred Kersan was saying also after we had discussed his new chair of urban transformation. He said, Matthew, I should have called it chair of civic transformation because <laughs> this is this idea of what is different about what we're talking about now than what was 50 years ago. One of the things is we are uh, opening up and we're using transdisciplinarity explicitly because that's the only term among all these other terms that explicitly involves the stakeholders who are involved there. So this is part of this idea of Philippe Decola saying, we are skeptical now of meta-narratives. And in fact, the current discourse is more about these micro-narratives that amount to something. So having said all that, I would love to just phrase the question to you both, and then you can respond as you like, and then we'll go for some questions from the audience. In relation to um, the work you're doing, Joachim, how do you see this continuity and change in uh, your work dealing with pedagogy and practice and policy? How much do you find yourself uh, deliberately taking a polemic position to make a point? And how much is it really about uh, avoiding those? And I would say the same to you, um, Filippo, in relation to your work, there's a uh, a tendency now, especially now we talk about what wasn't happening 50 years ago, well, climate wasn't much on the discussion. It was in some remote discourses related to uh, agricultural. I mean, uh, Humboldt talked about the dangers of human climate change in 1800 already. But uh, nevertheless, it wasn't so much in the discourse 50 years ago. And your work also with this historic mode of engagement, how much do you see your role as also taking a kind of... Uh, position to maybe broaden the, the repertoire of responses to climate change from adaptation and mitigation to also restoration and conservation and preservation in the same way that we talk about these fragments adding up to something and the missing link. Uh, it's often both, you use the term sprawl of uh, capabilities. I wonder if it's really what we're talking about is also still finally fragmentation of uh, capabilities and a spatial question since we started from form. Thank you. Thank you for your question. You hear me again? Yes. Thanks. Um, it's funny because when I finished my studies in Ghent, um, and that's even much longer ago than when you uh, saw what I was doing at the Berlag Institute, when uh, basically working quite a lot with Pier Vittorio Aureli, uh, Elia Zengelis, uh, Martino Tatara, um, uh, so enough Italian. Uh, influence uh, um, but also really trying to um, to find new ways to um, you know, we were in the Netherlands so uh, makeability eh? in Dutch eh? the, the fact that you can make society when it's below sea level is of course in it's in the DNA of that country and at the same time they do not succeed in it anymore but but then we were really trying to, to find ways to do it but when I finished my studies in Ghent University um, <clears throat> I made a PhD about, uh, um, uh, the title was HIC, uh, the, the Latin uh, uh, denomination of place, uh, of, of here, um, here in uh, HIC at Nunc. Um, but it was about uh, sprawl and about the, the concept of place in sprawl. And in fact, the word continuity was used as a, uh, parts of it were published, and the word continuity was used in uh, as a kind of by René Bomkes, who is a, who is a philosopher, uh, anthropologist, whom we interviewed and who then read and wrote about the thesis. Um, and he wrote that, it, that the most important thing was, in fact, that contrary to most of the design-driven approaches, we were looking for a form of continuity without negating the problems. Um, 
that were there. And I think that is still something where, yeah, where, where we're busy with. So uh, as an organization um, uh, in the past 10, 11 years, um, I think we're, we're more of a, uh, we're doing something that in a way, if I would be really critical, I see very little in the places where I would expect it to happen, namely within governments, uh, also with the research institutions, my own university, Ghent, uh, for example, to, to, uh, to persist. Uh, we need to deal with the energy transition, to give an example. Um, but in fact, we have all, uh, we, we are uh, stuck in a staccato of project by project uh, in an ad hocism, um, in a, in, in, often what is called not realistic and academic is what we do but my reaction is always that the way that is now being uh, uh, that the challenges are now being handled is utterly academic in the not in the beautiful word of that saying but in the more populist um, uh, use of that word in the sense that uh, non-realistic um, so I really think this is a, a problem and in, in that field it's really a challenge to take a, a position where we have very different projects in the in the practice so for example we are working with farming movements uh, agro agroecological uh, farming movements in an international consortium uh, an urban europe project where we really try to uh, push the boundaries you could say and we are not in the position um, to uh, uh, to to express the continuity before the provocation <laughs> Uh, but it's much more about pushing uh, the boundaries. My lectures and one of the one of the, the works, the, the ways of working is the cultural products. Uh, uh, from an exhibition to a to a book to a lecture, these are all uh, moments to to induce uh, or to contribute ideas um, to a public field. There is my it's my field of pushing. It's, it's the field of pushing, but always as an invitation. But then quite a lot of the work we do and the open space platform, for example, I showed with the diptychs and the triptychs, that is really trying, that's another type of work. It's, it's inspired by the first uh, uh, and by the critical analysis. There I always like the, it's the pessimism, pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of will. For me, the pessimism of the intellect also uh, Gramsci and goes towards uh, rather hard analysis and provocations, but still trying to formulate them as invitations to then be able to continue with the optimism of will um, and to find ways to group people around the table. And there it becomes nearly a combination of content, uh, uh, let's say, of, of a, a synergies in, in technicalities. Eh? So how does water work with food uh, production and so on? Who is behind? It's understanding people and their little and beautiful sides, um, uh, because otherwise you can't form coalitions. It's understanding the political game. Eh? If we are now accompanying the execution of a um, water landscape program, uh, which we which we co-invented with government, uh, which we call uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, civil servants, um, they. Uh, that is only working because we also made sure that the nature uh, associations, the agricultural sector uh, was around the table and made sure that they said yes. And that's a totally different work. That's actually really a coalition building uh, where, the, where the content is both, prov it's, it's really provoking, but more to invite. It's not to say you're wrong. It's more to say we have, it's not to say you're wrong. It's to say we have a shared question. Do you agree with that? And from the shared question, can we move? Uh, can we bifurcate in seven directions or could we choose one uh, direction uh, and that's i think uh, part of the work we're doing so I, I i like the the play between continuity and provocation is actually uh michiel dahane is our uh, president of the non-profit uh, association as a professor from ghent university it's actually one of his uh, remarks all the time um can you make clear whether you're now in the role of of bridging actor uh, uh uh, boundary spanner, or are you now in the ro now in the role of pushing uh, the limits of of the space we deem the logical space of of action? Um, and I think it's the it's the it's the yin and yang of what we do, uh, both of those. Hi, am I supposed to take the floor? Yes. Oh. Um, so, um, how to respond to this? Well, um, are we deliberately taking a, pot uh, a polemical position to make a point or a, 
a strong position to make a point. Yes, of course, this is part of the academic game. We all know that it's been part of the academic game for some time. And I think no one knows this better than your PhD students who are really uh, busy and struggling with this uh, all the time in an extreme competitive world. So uh, we know how it works and sometimes we force the terms uh, of what we do or say precisely in this direction. So uh, I'm eager to accept, let's say, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of, of game, but there are different ways to play the game actually, and uh, this is not the only dimension. Maybe uh, one uh, aspect of the transition I was trying to outline before uh, does have to do with the fact that uh, the academic game is not the only game that we have to play now, and maybe it's becoming increasingly unimportant from certain points of view. Uh, and uh, uh, personally, at least, uh, this is really a personal consideration. I am becoming, I am becoming increasingly engaged with this question of the of the public, with the need for professional historians, uh, whichever does specialization, to somehow engage with the public. And I am increasingly dissatisfied with the, let's say, the traditional understanding of the uh, link between scientific research and the public, by which. Uh, you do scientific research, you publish your scientific research, then at some point you engage with the public diffusion of your results. This is not the case anymore. Uh, I think we have to find a different way to give from the very beginning, from the moment of the conception, a public relevance to our uh, research uh, because the public is there, because there is a, a sort of a, a democratic uh, um, challenge to be taken there about uh, the, the relevance of our research for different people. And also because it's not just me wanting to engage with the public, but it's also the public that engages with me. I mean, I, would, I could stay in my room all the time and just looking at my books, but there is an increasing number of narratives out there and public positions out there regarding precisely the things that I'm studying regarding planning history and urban history. My impression is that over the last few years, public narratives on the history of cities and on the history of plans have become an overwhelming presence in our experience of cities for political reasons, for conservation reasons. They are everywhere. They are much more widespread than the work of planning historians, actually. So maybe this creates a, a totally different situations in which uh, the very goal and, and raison d'etre of planning history and urban history has to be somehow retold. And I'm, I'm not sure of what this means, I, and uh, I have to confess, I, I have not yet found uh, a strong way to deal with this problem. This is part of the transition problem. Can I maybe react to that? Because I see an, an, a really direct link now between what you just said and and um, a lot of what we do, uh, but what, what I did not express yet. Um, when uh, I can, I could also show many moments when we completely fail, and it's always. And for example, the, one of the moments I showed, but I didn't express it in detail, or I didn't went into depth of that, is the, the explorations of which we were part in terms of uh, the sea, uh, the coastal landscape of, of Belgium. The problem of that was that this was a, a role. It's we are. I'm not an academic in the sense that uh, Filippo is, a, is is an academic and a, and a researcher. Um, um, but the problem was there that as, as experts, we were advising governments um, without any public concertation, involvement, uh, and so on, which leads to the situation that politicians uh, in a representative democracy are supposed to solve all problems. And they do that by hiring experts, and then they should decide. But this, this typical role game is completely dysfunctional. Everything that I can show that works in, in, in the work we do, where we can say we, we, we have a little breakthrough, eh? I would always be very uh, cynical at the same time, eh? because it's little is an important word in the, in the phrase I uh, expressed, but we at least we know which step we took, um, is when you can uh, play at least in three or more, uh, uh, with three or more, from two or more corners. Eh? Um, I can give a very clear example. There was a, a plea from the former government architect um, in, in Flanders, um, and the word has become beton stop, uh, uh, stop using uh, concrete to, to pave uh, the whole territory. Um, um, that was a term that was also used in the policy making. Um, 
as a, an effect, in fact, the yeah, everybody, there was an up, a, a silent uprise against it. So everybody understood, and that's the positive side of it, that this was necessary. But as we don't know how, everybody started to say, yeah, but we still need houses. And, no, and if we build less houses, the prices of the houses will go up. So what's your solution to this? Um, we then started to think with a, a group of experts, um, amongst others, Freak Perseno and, and, and Michiel de Hane and, and others, how can we actually find a way to, to move? Um, and we said we, we should start with um, uh, proof turning, so pilot projects um, together with the, the planning uh, department on de-hardening eh, or de-sealing. There's no, I, I never know what the good English word is. And we, the cabinet of the minister said, uh, no, this is not the moment to, to launch this to the public. Um, to say beton stop and now we will do it. No, I can't do that. It's, that's an expert advice. I can't do that. Um, but we said, let's launch an, a forum, let's a de-sealing forum. And we ask all the initiatives that are ready to do it uh, to come together. And when we had uh, around 40 inscriptions, the cabinet suddenly said, yeah, but this is interesting. And I just have to decide about what to do with 5 million euros from the climate fund, which we have to spend this year. Let's spend it in these pilot projects. Inscriptions go to 80. Um, and we have a forum. And so why? Because in fact, you use um, from the beginning, the public, uh, the, yeah, a, a form of democratic system. We, if I would, it's, it's far too easy, but it's a form of democracy of doing. You can't do what is right because you think it's right. Being right does not help us move. Uh, I think uh, in that sense, the relevance of what, what you just said, uh, Filippo, about research, and I think it's, it opens a complete different track about what you see uh, and how a plan is lying and not lying, and uh, um, because that's what plans always do, lying in part. Um, it's one of the, it's in the genes of, of plans. Um, um, it is, is engaging the public, may, makes sure that you get a, a completely different narrative, but also a kind of, uh, uh, different entry to the to the changes or to the to, to the study uh, you make. I'm talking more about uh, getting it done, and you're more more analyzing how it came into being and what is the value of certain parts of it and and and, and the lie uh, or the let's say or the the, the the narrative that is overly constructed uh, that is part of it. Um, I think this is really a, a crucial insight um, where. Uh, I, I see continuously and on a day-to-day -day basis that the newspaper are filled with mobility experts with a plea for another mobility system. Uh, but I'm always, uh, I find it so sad because they're always right and stuck in being right. And they are frustrated. They are really becoming cynical because they are right. And it's so, and that's, I think that this must also be personally very frustrating because, but, but we need another space where we, where we do not say that it was that it, that they are wrong, <laughs> uh, uh, but where we try to see where you find the connector, the, the the connection pieces to other narratives. That's why we always we like to work with anthropologists, um, because suddenly uh, the example of Rotterdam. Yeah, if you formulate the energy transition in terms of solving the humidity and the mushroom problem uh, and the ventilation problem of houses, that is something else for the people living there. Eh? That is not the same project. Eh? So I think this is uh, really critical to, to our practice, apparently, and that's what I learned today, both in uh, academic research, uh, um, historical research, as, as it is in, um, uh, let's say, future-oriented research. But I think that you would answer that also historical research is future-oriented uh, research, uh, which I agree with. This is really tying in in an interesting way. And just by segueing now to opening the floor to the neighbors, you've landed on something that's really subtle and evoking uh, merit. I think it, it merits mention what you just described about the seemingly disparate ambitions of many stakeholder groups and most projects is usually found to in fact be a source of commonality in basic things, soil, water, air, access, this kind of fundamental thing. And this ties into, um, yes, exactly. Maybe also partially provisionally responding to your uh, question, Filippo, about how to move forward. I wonder if a structural reading where we can really see, for example, we're accustomed to seeing the Venn diagram of society, economy, and environment as though they're somehow in independent of one another. But you were both using these, uh, this reference to interdependencies and it's so crucial. 
I think it's very interesting if we just reorient ourselves and acknowledge there's no economy outside of society. There's no society outside of environment. So these are in fact dependencies which can help clarify the flow of exchange and information. So on that note, I would love to open it to the floor here. Are there any participants in the audience who'd like to go? The question for either of the participants. So nobody jumping up at the moment. Maybe there's somebody online who is participating that would like to raise a digital hand as it were. If that's the case, Ellen, I will take it. Yes. No. I think that really it was a, a very intense uh, uh, event, this one with your uh, two presentations. Um, and uh, th there will be a lot of aspects that I like to discuss with you. Uh, but I'd like just to underline one. Uh, you know, when Filippo, when you have um, underlined the, the different velocity of your research operation, you, at the beginning, you say different velocity in uh, collecting, uh, collecting data and documents and uh, uh, transcribing, interpreting them. And uh, uh, it's a question that I really would like that you could uh, ask yourself both the, uh, your relation to the speed and the velocity of what you do. Um, why? Because when I, when I listened to uh, Joachim at the beginning, yeah, can we say uh, we need to find uh, to find synergy to find uh, inter interdependencies, and you can find it also through yeah observation, careful observation. But you you have never used the term description that it was so relevant for also the position of power that you have mentioned, and I remember that description is traditionally related to a sort of generosity in terms of time, a sort of a long uh, uh, time, availability of long time, and observation is slow, is a slow process in a way. And um, maybe I, I just would like to, to, to hear by Joachim this, his own relation with the, with the speed and the velocity, and also in which way um, practicing so uh, often exhibition is part of a process where you look for more speed or you look for a, a stop. Uh, and uh, also, Filippo, if you have something to, to, to add to um, develop uh, wider your relation with, with uh, the, the speed and the time, maybe in terms of the relevance that the narrative are narrative and are, are taking in your own uh, concerns. This, this will be sort of a final question. Go ahead, Filippo. Okay. Uh, very quick. Also because I, uh, I declared that I do have a problem, I didn't realize that when accepting, but uh, I, the office from which I'm calling will close at 8 p.m. So at some point the police will come to take me. So um, I am I will answer the question, but uh, and then at some point I will have to leave. Um, apologies for that. Um, my um, well, this relation with time is very, very complex. I think it, in my research experience and in, in what we do, uh, the, the the example I presented was a, an example of things that were going very slow at the beginning of my studies in a certain field. Now things are much faster. I mean, I go into an archive in some parts of Europe or Italy with my not even a camera. I bring my iPhone and in basically two days, I bring back with uh, uh, some 10 gigabytes of pictures that contain an entire archive. So this is a different way of working, uh, not necessarily better, but certainly totally different. So from this, this point of view, uh, we can gather an impressive amount of information in a relatively limited time, at least in certain conditions, because there are still in my field of research, there are still some areas in which research has to go very slow, but still. Uh, I, have, I am still very slow in some things I do. So for example, I've even become slower, possibly as a reaction to this in some things I do. For, for example, the writing process has not become quicker. Uh, on the contrary, I try to 
to, to make a sort of experiments in order to make it slower, if possible. I complicate my life in impossible ways because I have the impression that uh, to have some obstacles to, that need to be passed uh, is a way to force oneself to reflect about what you do. So maybe there is a certain, at least in my personal experience, but this is very subjective, I guess. We are reacting to this situation in different ways, but uh, I realized that I have tried to bring back this sort of slow experience in some other aspects of my working. Um, then there is a, a third point is that sometimes I have become uh, faster because of experience. And there is something that I think this applies, uh, it is not, uh, this does not just apply to research, but to our professions. Expertise is also having me come faster, not because you repeat the same procedures, not necessarily because of that, but because your past experience combine to let you react to situations in a totally different way. You don't have to reinvent categories every time. Maybe you do invent new ways of uh, dealing with problems, but they come out of a combination of things that you have already done and that somehow uh, bring back a different picture. So, uh, and finally, fourth aspect of the question, it's uh, uh, the fact that we live in changing times, of course. I don't know whether these times are accelerating or not, but the questions that uh, what stays around us poses to our role as researchers, the questions that we pose to documents as a reflection of uh, the, the environment in which we live are totally are really changing. So, and this kind of pressure or time is something that I'm feeling very strongly in, uh, in my daily work, both in teaching uh, and in researching. It's not just about researching, it is about the changing environment of the universities we live in, the changing identity of students, the changing questions they pose, which uh, in turn bring uh, other questions um, to the surface, etc. Thank you. And if I don't see you anymore, thank you for meeting uh, again, <laughs> Filippo. Um, uh, sorry. Um, time. Yeah, I'm, I think uh, I, I can give a very, let's say, more uh, content-driven and personal character-driven answer, I think. Uh, to be honest, I am not made, um, I think I am not made to write a PhD. So I respect you all because I'm too nervous for that, um, I guess. Um, so I have a kind of a internal engine that would get very nervous um, when having to slow down so much. So the way we work, I think, is by considering uh, individual trajectories or projects as, uh, yeah, as experiments that contribute to a larger uh, exploration and narrative. And so the slow is not in uh, parts of the work we do, but it's actually what, what is hovering through. We, we try to see how we can yeah, incrementally build, uh, and that's also the, 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 the title I use for the course uh, of this year, Transformation from Theory to Practice of Change. I think it's, there's really a practice of change to be formulated. Um, and I think we are not at all there, but we see the, the beginnings of this, how uh, how you can work with different stakeholders. Uh, there's not one method, but there's still certain principles you can uh, you can start uh, seeing. So I, I think that's that's the slow project, um, uh, in the sense that yeah, after ten years we're we're somewhere and nowhere. Uh, so are we fast or are we slow? It's up to you to decide. I would say it's fast enough for me uh, because there's a lot of work to meaningful work to continue doing. Um, but it's slow in light of what we have to do. And I think also looking to the challenges, and if I say, if I use the word acceleration, I think it's maybe not completely true uh, that, that the word acceleration is maybe a, a wrong uh, word. Um, I think persistence is maybe more important. Um, what I mean with that is that um, the, the explosion of ad hocish projects looks quick, uh, and it's maybe also a kind of, uh, yeah, uh, a cluster bomb of things happening in and ar around us uh, in society. But I think the persistence, trying to say we, we take the question, we, we describe indeed the question, we go slow, we do uh, cartographic exercises that are not the way, the, we don't function the way that, for example, Studio Vigano is functioning, where the descriptions are of, of specific territories, 
this is a this is an urban practice uh, doing design research we are more describing things so that different stakeholders can recognize themselves in what we draw how we represent it uh, that they, they recognize their and that's that is rather slow work it's it's um, it's interdisciplinary so you need a lot of translation uh, work uh, so i think there we we are we are not always uh, quick and dirty uh, and i think you're right to point to the exhibitions um, i don't know if they are they are always quick uh, uh, let me just interrupt you a second because i seen that filippo is going away so just let's yeah. bye filippo thank you very much we are we are just <laughs> almost going away sorry for this so <laughs> But I really risk getting arrested. So um, thank you very much. Apologies for being forced to, to go. It's been a fantastic conversation, really. Uh, so I look forward to see you again soon. Um, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you to thank you. you. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> uh, so I, I will finish. You thank you. Finish I will finish my sentence. Um, I think exhibitions are both, uh, are more part of this slow trajectory, uh, at least for us. Uh, we are not uh, a cultural institution that produces exhibitions with with uh, many different curators that tell their own individual story as an as an ad hocish project to to make a program of exhibitions. We are seeing exhibitions as a form of uh, as an instrument of this incremental knowledge building system, um, and that is part of the slow. While the producing of an exhibition is always an incredibly tiring and fast. Uh, process because that's that's like finishing a PhD uh, I assume I don't know but uh, or finishing a book I know what it is finishing an exhibition is the same it's you it's a funnel at a certain moment you need to agree on every line that is written on every object that is chosen it is uh, extremely hard but it is so crucial to do it because otherwise you, you remain in a kind of fuzzy cloud of of material and progress and and the editorial process is crucial to to um, yeah, to have milestones to a certain extent, or I often use the word estafette, uh, or the, the, the we, we need to produce the baton, uh, the, the, the sticks uh, of the estafette, otherwise you can't move on. Uh, and it's about persistence and a slow trajectory, but also making sure you have sufficient sticks, uh, otherwise nobody knows anymore uh, where to walk. Thank you, thank you very much, Joachim. Uh, now, I, I think uh, I thank uh, everyone who is there and everyone who is uh, on Zoom. And uh, I am very happy that we have uh, uh, shared the, the, the conversation with uh, Joachim and Filippo. You are also so uh, wonderful personalities. <laughs> this is uh, very, very important. And uh, we can't uh, invite you to our apero. We have a, we are having a real apero now, not a virtual one. And, um, for, for, for you and also uh, uh, people on Zoom, we'll, uh, we'll have a, our next uh, meeting, our next uh, scholars in transition uh, in uh, uh, mid-December, the 15th of December, with uh, Frédéric uh, Clair, uh, Keck, uh, an anthropologist uh, on uh, epidemia topic, and uh, we'll discover that. Um, so thank you to, to everyone and uh, have a nice uh, evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye, Joachim. Bye bye. bye.